While this one came a bit out of nowhere, but more than one year after release, we are looking back into Wolfenstein the New Colossus again, or TNC as I like to call it for short. And even though we at DF at the time probably did not give the PC version the most in-depth treatment that it deserved, we aren't actually looking at the game as a whole here, rather one very small but very new and curious addition from a patch on PC, VRS, or Vicarious Rightist Slaying. Wait, it's not it. Variable Rate Shading. Variable Rate Shading is something we first got a glimpse of back at a Gamescom this year, being touted as a new feature for the Turing architecture. But with all the noise regarding price, performance, and the big elephant in the room that is ray tracing, it's pretty easy to understand how this flew under the radar. Heck, we only really heard about this patch just moments after it released. That is a little bit surprising because VRS represents a big change to the way a game is rendered. The change is big, but the idea behind variable rate shading is simple. In any one given frame of a video game, there's probably a lot of surfaces or areas that just don't need to be so accurately rendered for any number of reasons. Maybe they're dark, maybe they lack detail, maybe they're just moving so fast that you really cannot see them anyway. A GPU ends up shading and rendering to a level of detail that may not be appreciated or cannot even really fully resolve anyway. So to save on performance on the GPU, why not just reduce the accuracy of how these regions are rendered and shaded and make them less detailed? That is exactly what Variable Rate Shading or VRS does. Now this is something developers have been talking about for a long time now. Think about it. Does a pitch black room in Doom 3 really need fully detailed shading? It's all black anyway. There have been even similar attempts to do it at different parts of the GPU pipeline, like for post-processing. Crisis 1 added an optimization to increase or reduce the amount of samples for motion blur, you really don't need a bunch of samples for a very short distance. You can also see the idea pop up in developer presentations over the year in various forms, for VR for example. On a technical level, the way it functions is rather interesting. The idea is as such. The GPU is able to break the game screen into quadrants of 16 by 16 pixels across. That sound familiar? Well, Battlefield 5 is doing something similar for its ray tracing, albeit not for shading. That's for rays. Within one of these 16 by 16 pixel boxes, you would normally have each pixel being shaded based upon its center point, which is something DF viewers should know now from my anti-aliasing video. Well, the GPU breaks down the screen into these 16x16 16 16 boxes because the game developer and game can feed a texture to the GPU through Vulkan, the NV API, or DX12 extensions. This is a color coordinated texture which describes coarsely how each of these 16x16 16 16 voxels should be shaded either on a per pixel level with a 1x1 1 1 ratio or in groupings in powers of 2 so 2x2 2 2 pixels for a coarser shaded result or at the lowest with 4x4 4 4 pixels shading that result. You can even do non-square results with 1x2 pixels for example. So in that 16x16 16 16 pixel region you essentially can have a lower internal resolution output for how the pixels are shaded. The shading of pixels maybe lower in a tiny part of that screen perhaps as a total, the amount of visible pixels in total comprising the image is still the same, they're just lower detailed. Since that is the case, and it is mainly about surface shading as I understand it, the rendering of things done afterward or superimposed over that shading will still be at native resolution, as the total amount of pixels visible is technically still the same. It's just that their content is less detailed. So you will still have native resolution for other things should the developer choose, like Bloom, SSAO, motion blur, maybe even particles and things like volumetrics even. These effects though may derive their full resolution work from this lower detailed shaded result. So it could have some knock on effects, maybe changing the appearance of that post effect for a bit. The way that texture from the developer is fed to the driver and the GPU can be made in almost any way and for any reason the developer sees fit for their use case. All the driver and GPU really care about are this texture itself. So there are at least three or four different ways that are recommended use cases how to make this texture. Firstly, there's content adaptive shading based upon a metric of color or brightness. Looking at the currently rendered frame in a post-process manner, the game can generate the texture tile by seeing how similar a pixel is to its surrounding neighbors in that 16 by 16 grid. If their color is similar, or maybe their level of luminance is similar, then it could generate the texture by lowering the detail in those regions, where the game thinks color and brightness are perhaps overly homogeneous. 
so low detailed regions will then also be rendered at lower detail, or a lower rate of shading. The second type is motion adaptive shading. Here an engine would use its motion vectors that are generated for motion blur or temporal anti-aliasing to decide which pixels need less precise shading. Like I describe in the tech focus video on motion blur, engines track the directionality and speed of moving geometry or pixels in general, and then they use this to figure out motion blur or temporal anti-aliasing. Using this data, it could also generate tiles for this VRS texture fed to the GPU and driver, and say, hey, these pixels here are moving pretty fast, and they don't need as much detail. The idea here is simple. Our eyes and our displays have persistence problems, so flat panel displays in general have problems with showing motion. Even with backlight strobing or black frame insertion, they just produce blur and ghosting of pixels that change. Our eyes also have problems tracking things that are moving quickly, and maintaining that same level of apparent detail as we would see on a still object. So if they look lower detail anyways due to our displays and the way our eyes are looking at them, it's really not noticeable should we reduce their resolution or their shading rate. This can then be coupled with things like per object motion blur to make the effect even less obvious. So an object could be shaded more coarsely, but that coarseness could be hidden underneath a per object blur. Motion adaptive shading is pretty perfect for those games that have you constantly moving, like racing games for example. The last way to generate that VRS texture is for something called foveated rendering. Here the idea is also rather simple. Only render those areas of the screen at full detail where your eyes are looking. This would require eye tracking to know where a person is looking, but then you could just have the full rate shading at areas of focus, and all the bits around it are lost in peripheral vision anyway, so they're shaded at a lower rate. This is perfect for VR which has big field of views and high resolutions could also technically be done on a flat panel display should there be eye tracking available. Now all these ways to generate this VRS texture as I'm calling it are done in a post-process way on the current frame of rendering. So they will only ever perfectly apply to that next frame. So there's technically one frame of latency as to which bits of the image are rendered at which shading rate. Unless controlled for with safeguards of some sort, this means a hard camera cut or some extreme level of motion might have a misaligned texture describing how it should be shaded. Wolfenstein 2, the new Colossus, uses the first two of these methods to determine where and which parts of the image need less shading work. These are exposed through four presets which were added in the patch and four slider controls. You have the ability to turn it off, of course. Then there's the quality preset, balanced, and performance. Then you have the custom option, which allows you to tweak the four sliders determining this VRS texture. The quality option going from negative 100 to 100 allows you to tell the render how steeply it degrades regions of the image that it decides need less shading. So the closer it is to negative 100, more regions of the screen needing less shading will be shaded in a 4x4 fashion, instead of 2x2 or 1x1. So look over here at the sign here as I adjust that value down to see how it becomes less detailed. You can also see how a value of 100 has similar performance to the entire setting being set to off. The next two controls you have are color sensitivity and brightness sensitivity. The quality presets of balanced, quality, and performance do not affect these controls at all. Presumably this is the case because the developers at id and machine games tuned the sensitivity of color and brightness based upon what they thought was acceptable, given the game's art its levels, its lighting, and what they maybe thought is the kind of level of detail that they want to achieve. Color sensitivity goes from 0 to 100, where 0 makes the game more readily degrade areas of similar colors. To show it off, I left the quality slider here at negative 100 to purposefully degrade the image in an exaggerated way. So look here around these signs. There's some good local contrast here with the red trim, the text, and the backdrop. Turning down the sensitivity for color makes it ignore those differences more readily and decreases their shading rate. Brightness sensitivity also goes from 0 to 100. To control this, I left the quality at negative 100 again and the color sensitivity to the default 63 as set up by id and machine games. This uses a pixel's luminance or its brightness to decide whether it needs per pixel shading. The great example here is on the hood of this car. With normal color sensitivity, you can see how that shading rate is not changed greatly between the different levels, as the texture on the car itself here, on its hood, and the lighting of that texture makes it look pretty noisy. All the pixels and the neighbors are different in color, 
but here brightness sensitivity when going down will make the hood of that car shade with less detail. While the pixels themselves are very different in color, they are lit and are shining with a similar level of intensity. The last bit of control you have from a slider is a tough one to capture, and it presumably works differently than you may even think. The slider is called motion influence. You would think it just degrades the level of shading based upon how fast something is moving in general, but it really does not as far as I can tell. Notice how it is not called motion sensitivity though, and it instead is called motion influence. Just making objects or pixels to be more coarsely shaded based upon their direction would probably be too dumb of a metric. It could end up looking like highly detailed objects would be overly pixelated as they move, I imagine. I checked here and there by looking at rapidly moving objects with motion blur set to off, like the ceiling here as this train goes by, or looking at this winding mechanism on this weapon as it charges. Different levels of motion influence really did not have too much of a difference as far as I could tell. Rather, what I think this option does is it influences or depresses the brightness and color sensitivity, and maybe even the quality setting based upon the velocity of an object or a pixel. So any moving object can have a higher chance of being shaded differently than usually, but it still may not meet those minimum requirements of criteria for color and brightness sensitivity. So it's pretty hard to notice, but I can only imagine that it is working. Since VRS and the VRS texture is based upon the content of the screen at any given moment, its effect on performance can also be different from moment to moment. I checked out the differences of the presets by doing a more or less tracked run through this dark New Orleans level. The difference between native shading and the performance preset could in some views be around 20% almost, or down to them not being very different at all in other scenes. Over all the frames for this performance capture, I found that the quality preset on average had a near 0% performance difference, with its performance advantages basically being averaged out into nothing due to the variability between runs and what was on screen. The balanced preset on the other hand ran about 6% better overall through the course of play, and the performance preset around 9-10%. to now why does that look so underwhelming? Well, it is just how it works with the presets and how the technique works in general. Those scenes with more alpha on screen, with fire and particles, or just more noise in general, will have frame rates that are more similar between the different presets. Scenes with more noise will have more of the scene resolve in full detail or full rate shading, and alpha effects are testing a different part of the GPU, not necessarily related to shading. Rather, its bandwidth is going to become the limiting factor there. TNC here is definitely not the most dramatic showing for this technology. For one, this game already runs at insane frame rates on Turing cards. Even at native 4K, with settings, it is normally above 100 FPS in most scenes. That's just absurd. To get these performance results to be more dramatic, I had to seriously underclock the GPU here. But for other games where the shading is the most expensive part of rendering, this technology could be pretty transformative and also unintrusive. But beyond TNC and an RTX 2080 Ti, this technology will probably become more ubiquitous in time as we see different implementations and as its effectiveness increases. I imagine that it will not just be limited to Turing GPUs in the future, as developers have been asking for it for quite a while, especially in the VR space. I would not at all be surprised if next-gen consoles supported it to some degree. And one thing that I could not help but think of was the inevitable switch successor. Variable rate shading is most effective when GPU resources are already stretched, and the pixel density on the screen is very high. That sounds like an amazing way to get handheld games look and run that much better. Also, nothing is preventing this technology from being used in a different manner. Instead of just basing the VRS texture upon color, motion, and brightness variables to generate that texture, it could also have performance thresholds as to when it activates. So instead of full screen dynamic resolution scaling like we see in so many Switch games like TNC, Doom, Zelda, Warframe, and so on and so forth, you can imagine the scenario where instead of the entire image being scaled, you have little bits of it being scaled, and those areas that need less detail anyway, where it's not intrusive. This tech could be an amazing matchup with the next Switch. In this though, our job at Digital Foundry will become only that much harder. Instead of having fixed resolutions or dynamic resolutions in games, different parts of an image would be lower resolution looking. Even our resident pixel-counting maestro Tom Morgan might be a bit confounded in counting those edges. 
So in the end, this is just a neat outing for this technology. Variable rate shading in TNC does not offer the crassest performance benefits. It is so subtle though that there's almost no reason to not have it on the performance setting always. Also, I would really like to praise id and machine games here for offering all the slider options that it has four of them in total. Tinkering with the tech itself to find out how it works is pretty neat. It also shows a great level of respect to PC players. Heck, the PC version of this game was already really amazing with great performance and Vulkan support, and all these different options should you have an AMD or Nvidia GPU. Now I'm just curious to see what other games and devices support this down the line. But that is enough from me for now. I really hope you enjoyed this video covering variable rate shading on how it works and where it might end up in the future. If you did enjoy it, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. Should you already be a subscriber, please consider hitting that little bell button in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to talk to me about foveated rendering and the like, write a comment below or follow me and Digital Foundry on Twitter. As always, this is Alex, bidding you farewell and auf Wiedersehen. Eva, auf Wiedersehen. <laughs>